In July 2021, unprecedented flooding hit towns in Western Germany and parts of Belgium, inundating entire cities with overflowing rivers. And in September 2021, a record number of people in the Pacific island of New Caledonia were diagnosed with obesity. Using the body mass index, a controversial yet very widely used metric of obesity, researchers have shown that the number of people worldwide who are obese has more than doubled since 1975. What do these two seemingly disparate events have in common? First, they are to a large extent caused by the habitats that we as humans like to live in, cities. But more importantly, the way in which cities influence these processes is determined by how we get around, which is predominantly by automobile. Urban transportation directly affects how much CO2 cities produce and thereby how many climate-related events we witness each year, like we did in Germany, how healthy urban populations are, how much physical exercise they get or do not get, and how many obesity or inactivity-related diseases we as a society have to tolerate. In the United States, 85% of the population travels to work by car, largely alone. We as a society in the US have come to tolerate 40,000 deaths each year caused by traffic, and another 200,000 deaths due to inactivity-related diseases which come with car-dominated society. Populations in many cities around the world are segregating into liberal or conservative groups, which hardly seem to ever talk to each other because they do not even occupy the same urban realm. You see, cars enable us to segregate into communities with like-minded people where it's easy to avoid those that are different from us. And most critically, in terms of climate change, transportation is responsible for over one-third of all CO2 emissions in industrialized nations and even a larger share in cities. How we move around in cities and how goods move around in cities literally is the largest contributor to climate change today. So as we often do in my research group at MIT, I invite you today to explore how the seemingly innocent decisions that city governments all over the world take on a daily basis can affect such large processes as climate change, public health, and social segregation. In only a century, these decisions have cumulatively transformed our human habitats from being dense, transit-oriented, and walkable to vast, sprawling mechanisms that consume so much energy and that output so much CO2 to the atmosphere that they have simply become unsustainable. If you just think about how much we have adapted our daily lives to the automobile, it's mind-boggling. From how we shop, to what our homes look like, to what we call our main streets, or even how we drop our kids off. This critique is not new. The younger generation has been telling us for years that the planet is literally on fire. Social movements have formed around the globe. The Green New Deal in the US, the Green Deal in the EU, and mayors have come to organize in groups like the C40 to tackle climate change together. So amidst so much noise around climate change, it's sometimes easy to forget where most change needs to occur, where the biggest problems lie. Yes, it's important to fly less, to convert our gasoline cars into electric alternatives, or to use less of our appliances at home. These will produce incremental change. But we don't just need incremental change. We need full-fledged systems change to bring our CO2 emissions down. We need cities that pollute less, that demand less energy, that are healthier, and that make us more aware of each other. You see, I think people get it. Most of us would like to move in more sustainable ways on a daily basis. But the built environment that surrounds us can make it incredibly hard to change our routines. 
We need to move away from cities like this, where the easiest connection to everything is by car, towards cities like this, where we can get to most things that we need on a daily basis by public transport, by walking or cycling. Cities that are dense enough to support amenities near our workplaces or homes. And let me be clear, I am not arguing that we need to get rid of cars. I am simply arguing that we need to get rid of the overwhelming dominance of cars in our cities. That we equalize, finally, the opportunities for world-class public transit systems, walking and biking infrastructure. So why is this better for climate change, you may ask? Because for each kilometer we move by car, each of us produces seven times more CO2 per kilometer than we do when we take public transport. And because walking and cycling are virtually carbon free, when we walk, we produce infinitely less CO2 than we, when we drive. Walking and cycling and public transit use usually also generates shorter journeys in cities. So we shouldn't just compare how much CO2 we produce per kilometer, but also account for the fact that we rack up fewer kilometers and make shorter journeys when we don't rely on cars and urban transportation. And spatially, if everyone were to drive everywhere, we wouldn't simply end up with an enormous infrastructure bill that we cannot tolerate to pay, as we've come to discover in the United States, but we would also be extremely wasteful spatially. So in other words, cities like here, Vienna, or London, or Tokyo, or even Tallinn, would be impossible to maintain if everyone were to drive everywhere. So that while the broad parameters of more transit-friendly, walkable, cyclable cities are known to planners, how individual projects that get permitted every day or plans that get approved every day affect mobility outcomes and thereby impact such great processes as climate change remains unknown both in research and in practice. You see, when cities approve large projects, they usually have to go through what's called environmental review. And one very important component of, envir of environmental review is traffic impact assessment. Depending on the location or size or use mix of the projects, mobility experts are called in to evaluate whether the project that is being proposed will put too many cars on the roadways during the morning or evening peak period for the existing infrastructure to tolerate. And if the added, low, if the added traffic that is forecasted produces or ex is expected to produce congestion, then mitigation measures are required and oftentimes paid for by the developers. These may include things like signal readjustments to ease traffic flow, road widening, extra parking spaces, or the addition of turning lanes. But let's pause here for a second. The process that we call environmental review routinely results in additional infrastructure for motorized traffic, which is the number one cause of CO2 emissions in cities. That does not sound right, and it isn't. We need to change that. What if instead we required that developers have to do pedestrian impact assessments? Imagine that the developer contributions to mitigation involve better sidewalks, more cycling lanes, better public spaces. We could transform our cities, not by vast infrastructure investments implemented by the public sector alone, but we could unlock the potential of having each individual project contribute to a different kind of city, thereby unleashing the powerful, indivisible hand of the market in the process. In my research group, we have been working on new methods to do such pedestrian impact assessments, which I will try to explore with you today. So how would this look like in practice? If you take this example district in Cambridge, Massachusetts, around the MIT campus, for example. Every district has certain origins and destinations that could form pedestrian journeys that differ during different parts of the day. In the morning, there are trips that go from transit stations to office places. At lunch, people may head out to eat. And in the evening, most of us head home, run errands along the way, pick up kids from school, and so forth. How many of those journeys will take place on foot depends on context. What is actually accessible within reasonable walking radii? Who are the people? 
The map here illustrates how many pedestrians are likely to be walking on every street segment in that same area of Cambridge. The thicker white lines denote more pedestrian flow, thinner ones less pedestrian flow during the evening peak hour. So how is this useful for forecasting how infrastructure developments or real estate developments could change the picture? Assume that the red buildings shown here on the map are going through redevelopment in a particular year. In other words, their use or size or use mix is changing. Now, these red buildings can generate new pedestrian origins where new trips originate from, or they can also form new destinations where trips from existing urban areas may be heading towards if they contain public uses like retailers and services and so forth. By plugging these proposed developments in to an existing pedestrian flow model, we can forecast what the impact of those projects is on walkability in an area, which is what this map here illustrates. This map shows the forecasted change in foot traffic as a result of those red projects on the map. You can see that most change is likely to occur around the Kendall subway station, which is a metro station right in the heart of the MIT campus, where a lot of additional journeys would head home during the evening peak hour. And how is this useful for policymaking? Well, if city governments know where most foot traffic occurs or where greatest change is likely to occur, they can target the investments to better public spaces, better sidewalks, etc., to the right places where they impact the most constituents. And furthermore, they could ask that the developers of these projects contribute not to wider roadways, but to better sidewalks and better public spaces, just like they have been doing for decades with traffic impacts as impact assessments for cars. And besides the forecast of how traffic is likely going to change on individual street segments, foot traffic that is, this sort of analysis can also tell us how the modal split, which is the proportional share of journeys that happen on different travel modes, like public transport, driving, walking, cycling, is shifting year on year. Is the whole district becoming less car-oriented, or is it moving towards more motorization as we develop further? You see, it's one thing for a developer to complain or to claim that the project that they're proposing is going to be extremely walkable and nice. It's a totally different matter if we test these claims as part of a model such as the one I'm showing here. The same redevelopments that I showed happen to be fairly close to subway stations and ample pedestrian destinations around them. Collectively, we forecast that they would be reducing car-based travel by 7% cumulatively and adding pedestrian journeys at 2% and bicycle journeys by 5%. This gives city governments the tools to discourage and not to permit projects that actually increase vehicle journeys in districts. And if we aggregate this together from not just one district at a time, but we do this for all districts citywide, we get a picture of how the entire city is changing year on year, project by project. Is the entire city becoming less car dependent and moving more towards green mobility modes, or is it doing the reverse? One city where we've been able to pilot this approach is Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne is particularly attractive for this sort of an approach because it's one of the very few cities worldwide that has been collecting accurate information on pedestrian counts on many of its downtown streets using automated pedestrian counters, as you can see on the right side of this slide. These data have two very useful purposes. First, they allow us to calibrate an accurate pedestrian model on real data from many months. And second, because the data is longitudinal, they allow us to test how accurate our forecasts are. You see, we calibrate a model on one year of data, then we add the redevelopments that are actually occurring in the city in the following year and forecast how they're likely to change foot traffic on city streets. And then we can go ahead and verify how good that prediction is because we actually have the data from the following years. This map here shows the foot traffic we forecast for all of the streets in downtown Melbourne in 2014. Again, the white lines denote more walking. And as you can see, again, foot traffic is highest during the morning peak hour around the six train stations that dot central Melbourne, where lots of workers are arriving to go to their jobs. This map here shows 
the change, the delta in foot traffic that we forecast as a result of all the redevelopments that actually occurred between 2014 and 2015. Here, the red street segments indicate streets where foot traffic is likely going to increase, which is the majority of the streets. But you also see some blue segments where foot traffic is likely going to decrease because either buildings were demolished or new destinations were formed that attract trips away from particular locations to others. And over a course of multiple years, this sort of a model also allows us to keep track of how much walking happens citywide in a place like Melbourne. Is the city becoming less dependent on the car and generating more walking trips, which is what we're hoping for? Or is it actually moving in the other direction, which has sadly been the case here in Tallinn? How could we use this in practice? In Melbourne, instead of doing signal readjustments to optimize vehicle flow, we can do this for pedestrians. We can make in intersections more pedestrian friendly. Instead of road widening for traffic, we can make sidewalks larger. We can invest into parks and parklets and make sure that every street crossing is safe and comfortable for every age and demographic group. To make such a model a reality in more cities around the world, we don't just need a model, we also need better data. You see, today, as a legacy of the 20th century, most cities have excellent data on their roadways, where they are, and even how much traffic an average roadway or street segment has per day. This is great for traffic planning, but not so great for pedestrian planning. We need data to also describe where our sidewalks are and in what condition. And not only that, we also need data to describe where the destinations and origins that line those sidewalks are, that actually generate the pedestrian journeys we're interested in. And instead of just tallying traffic flow on street segments, which we have in almost every developed city, we should be, keep, keep, we should be keeping track of what happens on the sidewalks. How many pedestrians use each sidewalk? What kinds of social activities take place there? How many people may be pushing baby strollers, jogging, or talking to each other? In other words, we need to move away from planning our streets for motorized traffic and into planning our streets for non-motorized traffic users, or street users. So that the day-to-day -day reality is not only healthier, less polluting and more social, but also more pleasant. So that shopping doesn't necessitate acres of parking lots, so that arriving at our house doesn't mean parking a two-ton metal box, but instead our bicycle or shoes, so that our main streets don't involve honking at each other and yelling, but rather socializing, and so that our kids, too, can benefit from the same pleasures of walking to school that we did decades ago. And one last point. What I've shown is not a small ask. Transforming our cities involves transforming the most complex products of collective imagination and action that humankind has ever produced. So though there are certain things that we can individually do, we must for not forget that this has to be done together. We must not only change the bulbs at our home or put in better windows, we must mobilize collectively. We must get organized and we not, must ask our political leaders that we demand for a different future. This is a collective project. Thank you.